Hello, everyone. Welcome to a special G Zero Media live stream, Rescuing a World in Crisis. I'm Julia Chatley, anchor and correspondent for CNN International. And we're coming to you live today from inside the United Nations headquarters in New York City at the 77th General Assembly. Thousands of the world's most powerful leaders, policymakers, diplomats and business executives are gathered here this week to discuss concurrent and often colliding challenges. Among them, as you well know, the war in Ukraine, inflation, climate change and the still ongoing COVID pandemic. Throughout the next hour, we'll be discussing this moment of crisis with some of the world's top experts and hear their solutions for just how we can address it. Let me introduce our panel first. Brad Smith, President and Vice Chair of Microsoft. Ian Bremmer, Founder and President of Eurasia Group and G Zero Media. And Elizabeth Cousins, President and CEO of the United Nations Foundation. Welcome to you all. Elizabeth, I'm gonna begin with you. The UN is calling this moment an emergency of global proportions. We all know what's going on in the world, I think, but just define that and it's an emergency, but is there enough urgency to tackle it? Well, thank you, Julia, and great to be here. Um, there is never enough urgency to tackle the scale of global crises we face today. I mean, just think about how the world has been pummeled by a series of epic, once in a hundred years, interlocking crises from COVID to climate change to conflict in so many forms. You know, we have hundreds of millions of people who are food insecure around the world. I know we're gonna be talking about that later today. Um, we have, we're in the middle of what the UN is calling the greatest cost of living crisis in a generation. And on top of all that, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has delivered the single greatest threat to the values and principles of the UN Charter and the collective security that's defined the last 70 plus years of the international system. So it is not an overstatement to call this a crisis of epic proportions. Uh, and I hope and I believe we'll see a, a level of urgency here at the General Assembly that we actually haven't seen in years. I mean, many of those challenges are all interlocking as well and shorter term and longer term and, and feed into one another. In the one benefit of being back here for the first time in a number of years now since the pandemic is that we all get into a room and people actually debate these things. What are you hearing already behind the scenes? Well, I mean, first, I'm hearing that uh, climate change isn't going away, uh, mm -hmm. at least in the near term, it's getting worse. Uh, and of course, the Secretary General is very concerned about that. Uh, we have a third of Pakistan right now underwater, uh, tens of millions displaced. If you talk about the, um, the unwinding of the progress that we have seen on the human development goals, climate is the single biggest factor affecting that. And no matter how much we can talk about the war between Russia and Ukraine that is r waging and indeed getting worse, we can't forget that when we come back and talk about this in 10 years and 20 years, this is still going to be with us. This is an issue we have to put more muscle in. Right now, with all the headlines, it's a little bit less. That's a challenge. That's number one. Number two, of course, is the speech that was given by President Vladimir Putin just a few hours mm -hmm. ago. Um, it is uh, unfortunately uh, announcing of an annexation of the territory that he has already occupied on the ground in Ukraine. They're losing some right now. It's an occupation, it's an announcement of a special uh, call up of over 300,000 additional Russian troops. When they attacked Ukraine to begin with, that was 190,000. Just to give you a sense of the context, the expansion of this war is significant, it's dramatic, it's bad for everyone on the planet right now. Putin is increasingly isolated. That's a problem for everything that the United Nations stands for. And it was yet again rattling the nuclear saber um, if anything were to happen to Russia. Nice world you have would be sorry if anything were to happen to it. There's nobody that's on the global stage right now that isn't concerned by that. Yes, it's true that Ukraine is a war that the West is paying a lot more attention to because it's European. But of course, the knock-on implications for energy prices, for food prices, for fertilizer, this is affecting all of the billions of people on the planet and everyone wants this to come to an end. It's not what we're seeing right now. No, and this is part of the challenge, Brad. And, and of course, if we're just talking about the, the war in Ukraine, I mean, you've intrin been intrinsic in helping Ukraine fight the cyber side mm -hmm. um, of, of this war. But you're also one of the 17 advocates for the sustainable development goals, which we're going to talk about. Mm -hmm. And as important as it is, as talking about the war in Ukraine and the spillover effects, there are long term goals that we need to be tackling at the same time. And we can't separate those from the shorter term challenges those sustainable development goals need a booster. How do we even go about that when we're tackling the moments of the, the challenges of the day? I think it's perhaps, Julia, to recognize one thing, that we have these extraordinary <laughs> interlocking problems. You captured that. But they can unleash interlocking solutions. Think about how the war in Ukraine exacerbates energy prices, 
exacerbates food insecurity and makes the climate crisis work or worse. Then think about how the response to the war in the Ukraine has unified countries, mm. given a new sense of purpose to the United Nations, brought people together with more urgency. And then think about how that can translate not only to defending Ukraine, but to energizing, literally energizing, the electricity grids of the world with more access to renewable energy. Think about how it can focus us to address the root causes in some ways of at least the vulnerability of food insecurity in a continent like Africa, namely the fact that yields on average are only a quarter as productive as in the rest of the world. Think about how that you address those things and you start to build a foundation to address climate as well. So there, there are days when you look at this glass and it feels like it has very little water, but there are other days when you see there's an opportunity to fill this glass and do a lot of good here. This is why you two work so well together, because we've got the yin and the yang of, uh, <laughs> of the moment. And, and you're right, a lot of these crises, whether it was in sustainability, climate change, concerns about food and food insecurity around the world, they were already there. They were just exacerbated by this war, and this is very important. Um, in before this UN meeting or coming into this UN meeting, you had a chance to sit down with the Secretary General uh, and talk to him about consequences, severe consequences, particularly for the world's most vulnerable. I just want to uh, play you a little piece of this interview and we'll, we'll talk about that after. If you look at the developing countries, including many middle income countries, they are facing a perfect storm. So they have the climate change uh, impacts, as we all know, but they are the COVID. And we know how vaccines were distributed, and we know the problems that has caused. Then the recovery from COVID. We are in the US. I am from the European Union. Uh, trillions of dollars have been mobilized to support the economies, uh, with the consequence, of course, that the populations were supported, but also that there was a contribution to uh, the restart of a global inflationary process. Yes. Now, countries in the developing world, including middle-income countries, have not the capacity to print money, because if they print money, their currencies will completely uh, fall. Uh, they haven't received any special support. There was no debt relief except the suspension for the least developed countries. And we have a number of countries close to uh, uh, the verge of default, uh, with consequences that could be terrible for the world economy if we have a, a wave of defaults. Then middle-income countries, and all small island developing states are middle-income countries, mm -hmm. uh, do not receive any kind of concessional funding. No grants and no concessional loans from international financial institutions. Uh, and there is no debt relief for them. Most of them are with high debt, paying more and more high interest rates, and at the same time without any fiscal space. And now they have prices of food and prices of, of uh, fuel extremely, and, and energy in general, extremely high. I mean, in many, many circumstances, we'll face famine in the least developed countries, in the most dramatic situations in which climate change is contributing, with drought, uh, for instance, in the Horn of Africa. Uh, in other situations, you'll have uh, a, a, a dramatic uh, financial collapse uh, with terrible consequences for the whole world. And if countries have no fiscal space, how are they going to reorganize their educational systems that were devastated by COVID? How are they going to have a, a, a minimum capacity to uh, address the sustainable development goals and the objectives of development? How are they going to address inequalities? Because one of the dramas is that this situation is increasing dramatically inequalities. Inequalities among states and inequalities among people within each state. I think if you weren't nervous before, now you should be. Elizabeth, I think the Secretary General said it very well there when he said fuel uh, food and finance, the critical elements here. And we've started to see some societies fracture under the pressure that they're bearing. We could see a lot worse. 
No, absolutely. And we've already been talking about it a bit this morning. So first is just the impact on the world's supply of food, fuel, and fertilizers, because so much comes from a combination of Russia and Ukraine. But a lot of it has been the impact on prices, right, mm -hmm. um, which has had that additional blow to countries that are already um, suffering, communities that are already suffering. Um, you've seen, uh, you think about countries especially that are so import dependent. Take a country like Yemen. 90% of the food in Yemen is imported. So we've seen a laser-like uh, new attention to that problem of import dependence um, and, and real efforts though to try to, to try to deal with it even in the context of a war that as Ian said earlier is nowhere near stopping. So something like the Black Sea grain deal that the UN brokered patiently, carefully, has had already a really important impact so that first of all, you're starting to see exports of some food goods uh, that are close to pre-war levels and you're definitely seeing a dampening of, of the price um, escalation, which has been really helpful. The UN itself created something called the Global Crisis Response Group, which has brought together all parts of the UN system who have a stake in helping people and communities around the world in the face of this crisis. It also includes the private sector, importantly, because they've been absolutely critical in trying to help get goods out, um, help the private sector uh, survive under these very difficult circumstances. Uh, and so it takes everybody <laughs> working mm -hmm. together around a crisis of these proportions. But I also want to pick up on one additional point, which is the, the relationship between the short term and the long term. Right. So if you looked yesterday, there was a food security summit, mm -hmm. right, that the US, the African Union and the EU convened together with a number of other countries. If you look at the roadmap that they produced, some of it's about the emergence, immediate emergency. And there is famine on the doorstep and that needs urgent attention. But it's also about laying the foundation for a much more resilient, equitable food system. So it's about sustainable agriculture. Right. It's for lessening import dependence. Mm -hmm. So it's a powerful agenda and one that we really, I think, saw birthed here in an important way. In hungry societies break down. We've seen that in the past to, to go to the, to the food point. But I think also what the Secretary General was saying there was the, the inequalities within nations, the poorest in any nation pays a high proportion of their income on food and fuel, but also across nations as well. And that ties to the challenges of unity and a united response in tackling some of the biggest threats. Yeah, I mean, Antonio is angry because at the end of the day, he has a platform, but he doesn't have that power. He doesn't have the ability to ensure that that funding actually gets directed. And he's seen this now for three years of COVID. President Biden has just said that COVID is in the rearview mirror. Pandemic is over. But of course, for the countries we're talking about, the impact of COVID, they're only just starting to face. So when the Americans are saying, we can take off our masks and we're okay and we're back to work and yeah, inflation's a little high, but it's coming down. Well, no, actually for most of the people on this planet, the ability to get through the shock of supply and demand that have meant that they don't have the ability to borrow on the global stage, that they don't have the ability to feed their people. That's going to come out in the ballot box, but more problematically, that's going to come out in terms of the collapse and the fragmentation of societies. We've seen that in Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. We're starting to see it in Lebanon. Um, of course, I mean, it's making the issue in Yemen, as you said, much worse, but it's not just there. We will see this in Latin America. We'll see this in South and Southeast Asia, and the global response has as not the kind of leadership that we desperately need. And let's be clear, a pandemic didn't achieve that. It didn't achieve the At global all. unity that's required. So, so what more does it take, quite frankly? Um, Brad, as we mentioned, you've played a pivotal role in, in trying to address the spillover effects. Mm -hmm. In addition to the, the cybersecurity risks of what happened in the war in Ukraine, how can technology help us in addressing the challenges that we're talking about, be it the short term challenges, but also the longer term too? Well, in the first instance, I would say technology is a tool that can help us with any problem. So if we're trying to solve the problem without technology, then we're not doing enough to solve the problem. And you take these issues uh, like hunger and the like, food insecurity. Um, you know, what we're seeing is this convergence of technologies. We're, we're seeing more data emerge. We're seeing better satellite imagery. We're seeing the use of artificial intelligence. You know, we're using this, whether it's in Ukraine or in Africa, you know, to map crop yields, to be able to predict you know, where we need to move food from one place to another, and then address the longer term issues like sustainable agriculture. This is a time when, in fact, we can build a stronger long term foundation for agriculture by both improving productivity and improving sustainability. So it all requires digital technology. It all requires data. Now, it does also need to connect back with this broader theme. We have a world with greater inequality and a world of greater polarization. In part, you could say we have more polarization because we have more inequality. 
But we probably also have more polarization because technology, social media, mm. the internet, even the Russians' use of these technologies to divide people is becoming a root cause of our challenge in solving each of these things. There's more financial inclusion, though. I will defend yes. your sector even if you're not, thanks to, yeah. <laughs> thanks to what we've seen. But uh, I've got a yes, no answer. Are you working, are big technology companies working, and we'll come back to this later on, enough with the United Nations and big multinationals, for example, like them? Um, because to, to Ian's point, he just said, you know, the Secretary General's angry because they know what they've got to do in many respects, but actually they can't get there and do enough. Well, there's variation among companies. The, I think the sector as a whole is doing more. To me, though, there's two things that I think are important to note. One, and Elizabeth understands this as well as anybody you could find. Yeah, you know, The United Nations plays a fundamental role, not just in bringing governments together to try to solve problems, but in delivering tangible assistance to much of the world. You know, this is something that is vastly underappreciated in the United States. It's vastly underappreciated in the United States Congress. But when you're looking at the role that UNICEF plays for children, what the UN Development Program plays for, for development, what the Food and Agriculture Organization plays for, for food, what UNHCR does for refugees, if you look at all the problems of the world, the UN is delivering aid. And what we do as a, as a company is support the UN in doing that. That's why we have a team here in New York that's dedicated to making the UN agencies more uh, impactful through the use of, of technology. Your reference to financial inclusion I think is interesting, Julia, because in the world today, everybody needs two things. They need money and they need technology. Mm. If you want to do something great, if you want to solve a problem, or unfortunately if you want to do something awful, you're going to focus on both those things. Yeah, also say they need food too. We'll add a, we'll add a third one. Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. And, and, money and, to buy. and energy. Yeah. And energy. Yeah, and energy too. Okay, prior to this live stream, G Zero asked followers across their social media channels a series of poll questions about some of the topics that we're discussing today. Which of these issues concerns you most? Climate change, inflation, food security, conflict, and war. Let's reveal the results. Okay, 40% said climate change concerns us most, 33% conflict and war, food security and inflation way back. That surprises me. Ian, no. surprised? Um, I mean, it is your, your viewers. I'm not, you know. I'm not surprised about inflation being lower in the United States. Of course, it gets, you know, sort of heavy uh, knock on impact. But the fact is, this is a, a media coverage. But this is a global uh, survey. Mm. And so many of the people that are tuning in right now are not in the United States. And they are facing much more desperate challenges. I mean, if you're in Ukraine right now, you're not talking a lot about inflation. You're actually talking about like 44 million people facing, you know, sort of acts of unspeakable inhumanity. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if you're in Pakistan, uh, you're not ta you're talking about climate it, it's so obvious it's so direct and so I just think we have to right we didn't even put the pandemic there because you know, we didn't think we'd get a lot of responses from China uh, frankly uh, and and they're the ones that are in the teeth of that from that perspective right now uh, I, I think what we have to recognize is that these are a series of interlocking conflicts they are real they are frankly generational and they do unlock opportunities to rebuild, to reform institutions and architecture that aren't fit for purpose in the 21st century. But to get from here to there is going to be hard. It's going to hurt a lot of people. You know, my, my, my big topic this year has been Ukraine, clearly. If we had learned the lessons in 2014 when the Russians first invaded, we wouldn't have to deal with something worse, much worse right now. Yeah. How much is that true of pandemics? How much is that true of the last Ebola crisis? If we had only recognized we would be in better shape right now, but we didn't. So instead we had to get lucky with the vaccines. Thank God, because if we hadn't, we'd be having a very different conversation right now. So I mean, I really do believe that we have the crises in front of us right now that are spurs to global action. Some of them we are taking advantage of. We truly are. Some of them are not. And all the fiscal capacity that we yeah. burned in tackling a pandemic and are yes. using now to try and support economies to face the higher prices. And actually 40% yeah. of people are saying climate change and there just isn't either the fiscal capacity in parts of the world or the ability to, to pivot to tackle some of the longer term issues too. 
30 seconds because I can tell you want to say something, Elizabeth, and we're going to move on. We'll come back. Because we don't have the political stamina to see through the things we already know. So yeah. pandemic experts always talk about this cycle between panic and neglect, right? The minute there's a, anything approaching a global health threat of that kind of scale, there is panic. There are all kinds of commissions. People learn lessons. They're always the same lessons every single time. And then we go into a cycle of neglect because, of course, the, the global agenda, the domestic agenda is crowded. It's really easy to get distracted. But, but what should be a solution is that is this point of interconnection. There are a handful of things that if we do them right, we actually solve for a larger set of challenges in all of our societies. And we just have to get better at doing that. And I would just say, we didn't get lucky with vaccines. We got smart. It's, we, it's the point that Elizabeth just made. We brought government, business, science, mm. innovation with large amounts of money together exactly right. to do something that everybody felt was impossible. Except that, absolutely. Yeah. We're gonna come back to this for now. While all the sustainable development goals experienced setbacks since 2020, and we've been discussing them, one of the most alarming actually is the sustainable development goal four, and that's access to quality education. 1.6 billion students had their educations disrupted in the early months of the pandemic, and the consequences continue. Just in the United States alone, maths and reading test scores fell to 20-year lows. Globally, it's estimated 11 million girls will never return to school. That was the subject of a Global Stage live stream last week. Leonardo Garnier is leading the effort to transform education on behalf of the Secretary General. Just take a listen to some of what he had to say. Let me start by recognizing that after the terrible, terrible impact of the education on education of the 1980s crisis, the world and especially lower and middle income countries started to improve in their education investments during the first decades of this century. These improvements, however, were not significant enough in terms of the existing situation and the ambitious and yet very simple challenges of SDG4, which aims to, and, and I quote, ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. As simple as it sounds, for most developing countries, this goal remained a, a distant one even before the pandemic. First, it was distant in terms of, of mere access. It is estimated that at least 260 million children were completely out of school before the pandemic. I know big, big numbers are not easy to grasp, that's almost four times the total number of children in the USA, 17 times the number of children in Japan, 26 times the number of children in Germany, or 54 times the number of children in, in Australia, completely out of school. But it is even more dramatic in terms of effective learning. In 2019, it was estimated that 57% of 10-year-olds in low- and middle-income countries were unable to read and understand a simple story. Now, with the impact of the pandemic, it's been estimated that around 70% of children in these countries will not be able to read and understand a basic text by, by age 10. Uh, and this is not a, only a, a problem in, in poor countries, but a, a similar situation also affects children from poor families and neighborhoods in several high-income countries, like the US, reflecting a, a growing educational inequality. These are heartbreaking statistics. Joining us now, Kailash Satyati. He's one of the United Nations 17 SDG advocates and the champion of children's rights. In 2014, he was also awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. Kailash, fantastic to have you with us. One of the statistics that just was mentioned there, and I want to repeat it, even before the pandemic, more than 250 million school-aged children were out of school, even before the pandemic. Where are we today? This pandemic has exposed and exhibited many problems and especially the problems which the children have been facing. Mm. So the number of out of school children has grown. The number of uh, 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 dropout has grown, but that is also linked with a very important factor that when a large number of people have lost their livelihood, now their children are in demand as the cheapest source of labor. Right. Due to pandemic, but also before the pandemic due to several other crises. It is for the first time in 20 years that the number of child laborers has grown in the world before, 26, uh, before 20, 2020. So in the four years of SDGs, the number has grown from 152 million to 160 million. So 160 million child laborers means 160 million 
empty seats in the classrooms. This also means that 160 million jobs which should be or could be given to the adult people have been taken over by the children or pushed into uh, upon them because they are the cheapest source of labor, they are free labor in many cases once they are held in bondage and that number is growing. Only in Africa I would tell you that 10,000 children are pushed into child labor every day, every day since SDGs even before the pandemic. So actually, in terms of the targets, we're going backwards. I mean, that's the heartbreaking the truth about it's this. Especially in case of children. I mean, this has so many other implications, as you said, uh, the impact on, on families, child nutrition, child marriage, gender equality. It's going to push us backwards on, on that front as well. Um, it's a waste of, of a human potential in so many ways. Um, I know you've done a lot of work in, in India as well about the choices that families are making between uh, putting parts, some part of their family, some of their children to work versus feeding the others. And these are the life heartbreaking, heart rendering decisions that are being made, as you said, on a, on a daily basis. Absolutely. In spite of a lot of good programs in India, social protection programs like uh, school feeding programs and mm. other things in different states, cent centrally uh, sponsored program as well as the state programs, we see the growth in child trafficking. We have been freeing children physically from slavery and trafficking for last more than 40 years. Mm -hmm. But it has never happened during one year or one and a half year that my organization and we freed uh, or rescued uh, almost 2000 children during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So even during the pandemic, just after the first and second lockdowns in India, the demand for young children for child marriages, for domestic help, young children for prostitution and child labor that has grown mm. and we have to address it. Elizabeth, I want to bring you in here. Um, a lot of the work actually Kailash has been doing as well as on the shadow pandemic and uh, sexual abuse even before the pandemic and then of course lockdowns happened and, and we all I think saw the numbers saw. Um, there's an education funding gap again before the pandemic and now of course that's grown as well. This has to be on the forefront of, of minds when governments are making decisions over how they allocate stimulus spending and support but also fundraising surely. H how are we tackling this? Well let's let's think about the mismatch between the trillions of dollars in the global economy right. and let's say the two billion dollars that spends globally on secondary education for young people. I mean, that is the most glaring mismatch of investment <laughs> with, with outcome that I can possibly imagine. And I can't think of a country, low income to high income, that has a better economic future if it doesn't educate its young people. Mm. There is simply no path. If you don't, there's certainly not a path to stability, and there's definitely not a path to prosperity. So, um, so this needs an all-in, much greater social and political recognition of the challenges to the education sector. Some of that's also about the quality of the education sector. There are all kinds of things that need to change to be able to educate and really prepare the world's young people for the future. Philanthropy clearly has a role and is, uh, and, and is committed in a variety of ways, including community foundations. Philanthropy is many different things. Mm -hmm. It needs the business community. It needs governments and it needs political leaders to take seriously the kind of agenda that started with this Transforming Education Summit at the beginning of this week to say this is an issue of strategic importance globally and nationally and we have to treat it as such. Yeah, and it's just we're just not there yet. We're, we're not treating it w with the level of um, recognition and importance that it requires. Brad, technology once again in the hardest to reach places Admittedly, you have to have access to, to the internet, to broadband, but in terms of upskilling and providing education, technology is crucial and has been, let's be clear, through the pandemic. Yeah, we've been taking steps as an industry and with governments and with you know, the great NGOs of the world. And you see in an organization like UNICEF, I think this broad effort at the forefront to be in a number of, of countries. We reach at times people in refugee camps and the like, or we provide technology that's used as a tool to fight child trafficking. Of course, it's also clear we're not doing enough. Yeah. Nobody's doing enough. If we were, these problems would be getting better rather than worse. Um, but I think what it should hopefully cause us to do is, frankly, marshal more resources, concentrate them, double down on these things. And yeah, I think part of what the SDGs need to do is just help us understand where we are. You know, every year we have to ask ourselves, are things getting better or are things getting worse? And this is, 
know, part of the conversation this week, and I think uh, uh, in a lot of areas right now, things are getting worse. A lot worse. I think that's the message from this. Ian, very quickly. Well, just the fact that technology is a solution and an amplifier, a multiplier for so many different things in the world, but children need to be taught by people, yes. by human beings. And for two years, the panic of the pandemic also meant the neglect of the children mm -hmm. at the same Absolutely. time. It's not just neglecting the pandemic now. It's at the time. It's like, no, we've got to shut it down. Well, what about these damn kids? Yeah. What about these poor kids? And, and the fact is that even in a country like the United States, we thought it was okay if for a couple of years our kids could learn algorithmically, <laughs> which means that what's going to happen to them is has to do with a business model that has nothing to do with making them into, you know, sort of functional human beings that are parts of families that are part of civil society. And this is the we richest nation in the that. world. Yeah. 20 LOs in, in reading and mathematics. But the one thing I can say is that government leaders, and Brad knows this very well, are increasingly very aware of this issue. And if it is not resolved in the tech sector, it will increasingly be resolved outside the tech sector. So it's something we need to pay attention to. Yeah, we need to jump to that step where action is actually taken. I think we've set the scene quite well. Another poll. Uh, asking G Zero media viewers this question. Are you optimistic about the state of the world? And the choices were yes, no, or unsure. Here are the results. 25% yes, no, 59%, unsure, 16%. I will say it could have been worse, but it's pretty bad. Uh, it's the worst number. I think if any time we would have done this over the course of the really? past 10, 20 years, this is about as bad as I'd see it. And it is. It's the Human Development Report. It is all of these issues that for 50 years, globalization, there are a lot of losers in globalization, but the fact is we were growing a global middle class. The fact is we were, people were learning, people were getting better health care, and global poverty was being reduced, especially among the most poor in the world. Yeah. And everything you're hearing, especially from those most involved in the United Nations, is that that's now turning around. And so, and, and, and these are real that's people proof. that are telling you that. Yes. Kailash, I want to come to you too, because I know we mentioned your work in India, you have now, and now are focusing on Africa as too, uh, too, which is where you are most concerned about all of these challenges uh, coming into play. What do you want to see? What more do you want to see as someone is at the heart of tackling this and, and trying to make change and make a difference? Well, uh, there are two, two aspects. One is that I agree with you that um, artificial intelligence and technology mm. should not try to uh, replace the human intelligence or compassionate intelligence because compassion can come only from human being. Of course, technology is trying to build uh, compassionate machines, but it is it's too, too away. Uh, and uh, uh, secondly, when we talk of technology, that is also the problem in India and elsewhere in the world that during the pandemic and lockdowns, the demand for child sexual abuse material online has increased. In some places, it has been doubled. We did some studies and found that the demand and supply, and that also results in the engagement of children uh, by uh, number, uh, number of uh, supply chains in different places has increased. And uh, that is much more serious because we don't have any international legislation to check it and to hold uh, data service provider companies responsible and, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and accountable. So that is, is such a serious thing, such a gap and that is demand, the demand and uh, supply of children for child porn material production and child uh, uh, sexual abuse is increasing and they end up in slavery, trafficking, mm. prostitution and so on and some of them commit suicides and that is very serious thing going on. You have raised but so many points there, the, the mental health aspect, content moderation which will come to the role of, of big technology companies versus government and the controls. Um, thank you for, but for raising that one thing we can definitely awareness. learn and we can do it which we have been talking that there is a need of global social uh, protection uh, mechanism. I'm right. not talking about global social protection fund to be created. New funds could not be created so easily. But a mechanism which we did, I was the part of, I was the founder of uh, Global uh, Partnership on Education that was called First Track Initiative. And that came from the demand of civil society. And I was heading that time the global campaign for education. So we are demanding for the creation of uh, a global social protection mechanism because we have seen across the world in Europe we have seen in 70 years 
and also in poorer countries like uh, uh, Bangladesh or in mm. smaller countries in Africa, wherever the mid-day meal programs or cash conditional cash transfers and other things have uh, been in place, we have seen positive results and we can protect our children. If we cannot protect our children, we cannot protect the generations to come and yeah. the future of humankind. It's our future. Kailash, thank you. Thank you for joining us and um, some very important points made there. Look, up next, we're going to be speaking to Croatia's former president, Kalinda Grabar Kutovic. But first, here's a little bit more of Ian's conversation with Secretary General Gutierrez. And he's talking about the private sector's role in finding solutions to global crises, as we've been discussing. Take a listen. Civil society is playing a more and more important role. Business community was moving strongly in the right direction until the end of last year. I must say that the financial sector now, uh, to a certain extent, many of the key financial actors rediscovered the interest of fossil fuels. Let's be honest, and it's necessary that uh, this changes again. But there were more and more. There are more and more uh, private interests committed to climate action, not to climate change. And uh, the truth is that governments are, in many circumstances, an obstacle to what the private sector wants to do, because of subsidies to the wrong kind of things, because of regulations that are not adapted to the green transition uh, and because of uh, other measures to satisfy interests here and there, uh, which of course have as a consequence lack of coherence uh, in relation to a climate strategy. I actually love this because he was angry. <laughs> To your point, Ian, and, and here he's saying actually yeah. it's important, and I know I'm preaching to the choir with you, uh, at Microsoft in tackling climate change, there are companies, and I speak to lots of them, that if they're forced to make climate disclosures, um, they're going to fight it. And, and Ian, to your point, even if we look at the likes of China and the United States, the last bastion of their sort of compromise and discussion was on climate, and whatever it was, if you got a month ago or so, they decided to no longer talk about that either. How are we going to tackle these big problems if at times government and business can't combine, and at times big countries the biggest polluters in the world can't talk and but you have one minute to answer the biggest <laughs> government the two biggest emitters of carbon on the planet are china and right. the united states and as national governments they have not been leading on the transition at all but many actors in the united states and china are doing a hell of a lot that are leading to a transition they are mostly actually businesses and their financial institutions in part because china recognizes they have to invest into a post-carbon future so look what they're doing on solar and evs right. and supply chain in the united states it's less like that it's more like financial institutions that are saying wait a second we don't think we can make a return on thermal coal we think we actually i mean why is the united states's Per, per capita carbon emission down to 1913 levels. And it's actually because of transition from coal, which is basically dead, to natural gas. That was almost purely a private sector driven decision. We need to do vastly more, and the government's finally getting there, but we aren't where we need to be. I think Antonio's right. I agree. Brad? Well, I, I do, but I would add one thing. When Congress passed the Inflation Reduction Act, it would have been much more accurate to call it the Carbon Reduction Act yeah. because 84% of the new spending mm -hmm. in that legislation is going to go to climate. Yes. And it takes a path of stimulating the market. And I think the fundamental point here is get public, the public sector and the private sector working in tandem. I'm hopeful. I, yeah, I'm not an optimist about everything, but in this, I think the smartest money is going to go to the investments in new climate technologies. That's where the long-term payouts will come. Now, Brad, can it, you and I agree that Joe Manchin is not a vote for the Carbon Reduction Act? And you and I can probably agree that that's why it wasn't called the Carbon Reduction <laughs> Act. I was about to say, but that's <laughs> politics. Okay, this is a great kicking off point now. Um, for the need for multi-stakeholder solutions for all the issues, of course, that the world is facing, as you well know, Ian Brad's still with us, Elizabeth also still here, but I'm honoured now to welcome Kalinda Grabar Kitarovic. She served as president of Croatia from 2015 until 2020. The first woman in her country elected to that role. Madam President, fantastic to have you with us now. I know you were listening to that discussion, which is very relevant, but I do want to take it back actually to where we began the broader conversation, and that is the war in Ukraine. You have personal experience of, of what your region of the world went through in the Balkans. We'll rather call it Southeast Europe. I know that's important um, too. There are 
degrees of parallels, but I know you're also worried about spillover effects yeah, from absolutely. the current war in Ukraine. Absolutely. It actually feels so close to home and it mm. brings so many memories. There are so many parallels between the wars uh, in uh, what I don't like to call the Balkans, but uh, Southeast Europe, and the war in Ukraine. Uh, it was an open aggression that was uh, premeditated, that was planned, that was done under the pretext of protecting uh, Serbian population in Croatia and in other countries against the pro-Nazi Croatian government. Uh, it was um, um, a hybrid type of war warfare using people on the ground who were under uh, information blockade and uh, it was aided by the so-called Yugoslav national government openly uh, and what we saw actually in Russia on the 24th of February was an open aggression against Ukraine although it will uh, not be admitted. Uh, the parallels are great as well. Uh, the war was so brutal and there was ethnic cleansing uh, targeting civilian target civilian populations, scorched earth, earth theory uh, and driving people out of the areas that were under occupation and that we were determined to reintegrate uh, into uh, Croatia. Now, uh, what we see in Ukraine is obviously uh, an aggression that um, overnight practically has uh, escalated uh, in the way that President Putin gave his speech last night announcing uh, openly uh, the um, the fact that there will be a referenda for annexation of the occupied uh, territories uh, uh, to Russia and uh, partial mobilization of about 300,000 troops. Now, what uh, uh, is unsettling in, in all of this is uh, the fact and, and the difference between the wars uh, in our region in the 90s was that those were regional wars. Mm -hmm. But this one in Ukraine has really so much potential to metastasize outside of the conventional type of warfare, but also to uh, cause other uh, major crises and, and to actually to become a, a global crisis. Uh, and um, uh, another aspect that is unsettling is that we now see again parallels drawing back to my own neighborhood. The uh, Serbian member of uh, the presidency of Bosnia and Herzegovina is currently, as we speak, in Moscow. He had a meeting with Vladimir Putin yesterday. They spoke about energy cooperation. They spoke even about a football game between Russia and Bosnia and Herzegovina. And he also announced that uh, the referenda that are being planned are for the people to decide and that the will of the people have to be respected and that Republika Srpska is ready to send monitors uh, to those referenda. So it's escalating and we're also hearing voices in their neighborhood, again, that um, Serbia has the responsibility for denazification of the Balkans, that borders are not set um, in stone so the, uh, this aggression is again a very dangerous precedent of trying to change the borders, mm -hmm. uh, internationally recognized borders uh, by force. And Madam President, we can hear the emotion in your voice as you said it, it's personal. Um, it is very personal. And as you know, probably a um, number of our neighboring countries, uh, NATO members have been under cyber attacks. So things are stirring up. I want to get some context on that, Brad, from you in a moment, because I know you have um, the inside track on, on cyber attacks wherever we are in the region. But Ian, just, I want you to talk about this too and, and the danger of spillover effects. You've said that, that this war is ripping up geopolitics and, and there are big questions. Uzbekistan and the meeting between President Xi and, and President Vladimir Putin last week as well, with everyone trying to understand sort of the axis of power and, and which direction I think the international community takes and the fracture lines that are created. What do you see when you look at at this specific point in the region in particular? Well, for the last seven months, um, the West, NATO, the United States, the EU, allies in Asia have made very clear to Vladimir Putin yeah. that his economy will be destroyed and his country will be isolated diplomatically and economically, cut off from the advanced industrial democracies. First time that has ever happened to a G20 economy in the post-war era, if they persist with this war. He has absolutely ignored all of those threats. Secondly, over the course of the last weeks, and certainly last week in Uzbekistan at the meeting of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, mm. Putin's friends started warning him publicly. When the Indian president tells you, the Indian prime minister, excuse me, Narendra Modi, tells you that the age of war is over, when Putin starts in his opening statement to China saying, we know you've got some concerns 
uh, about Ukraine and, and China says we're not on your side on this issue when the Kazakhs, the Kazakhs are saying that they will support sanctions of the United States and Europe against Russia. The reality is that Russia is under massive political pressure. In the course of this war, they have gone from being the most important partner of China on the global stage to becoming a rogue state like Iran, but a rogue state with nuclear weapons a rogue state with resources that matter for the global environment, a rogue state with espionage and cyber capabilities that are pointed at the heart of Europe in a way that they have not been for 30 years now. So, I mean, I understand how personal this is, but I also understand how much of a disaster this is for the entire world. And, and, and right now we are, this is the one where, uh, Brad and I can talk about all the areas where we think that things can get better globally. Yes. This one right now is heading worse. And one could argue that he's no longer ignoring it. The actions of the last 24 hours suggest that even with those warnings, he's saying, bring it on. Uh, Brad, talk to us about specifically the, the cyber security angle here and what we've, we've seen in the region, because I know you do have context on that. I'd say a few things. I mean, first, I think the cyber aspect probably demonstrates that in some ways this work probably should be considered personal to everybody. It doesn't matter no. where you live. Mm -hmm. Not only because the principles that are at stake are so precious to the world, but in some cases we live in a world where with cyber attacks, you know, literally these weapons move at the speed of light and can reach anywhere in the world. Now, if you look at how the war has unfolded so far, and we don't know whether seven months is a small percentage of the length of this war or long, we don't know how long it's gonna last, I think there's been success more than failure in thwarting the destructive attacks that have been launched by Russia. But at the same time, we've seen to some degree this almost normalization of more aggressive cyber attacks, including by Iran against Albania. We'll see what is learned based on the attacks on Albania and others even in the last 24 hours. I think all of that is unfortunately also a potential leading indicator of the use of digital technology to expand the scope of the conflict, potentially not just ge geographically, but through a variety of means, including you know, destructive attacks, espionage-based attacks, in effect cyber influence operations that are designed to undermine the public confidence, whether it's in Ukraine or in other countries. All of this has a long ways to go, and certainly I do think the world feels like a more dangerous place today than it did a year ago when we think in these terms. Madam President, you have met with President Putin many times. You know him better than most. In your experience and what you've seen and history, do you believe he can be stopped? What do you see as the end game here, and is there a path to peace? Well, it's almost impossible at this moment to predict what the path forward will be. Unfortunately, what we've seen is escalation. And I hope that uh, some of the threats to go nuclear will never be realized. And because Putin and everybody has to know that a nuclear war cannot be won and must uh, never be fought. Uh, the path to peace, um, knowing him, he is a very proud person. He was driven by his feeling of humiliation that Russia had been humiliated uh, during the Cold War. His uh, program was to restore Russia's standing in the world and Russia's economic political power, which now he has uh, really jeopardized. He's, uh, Russia has become a junior partner to China. Uh, sanctions are having an effect. They are. Um, it's uh, not true to say that there are not. So he has weakened Russia. He has weakened uh, the Russian military machine. But he's also the kind of person who would never, ever admit defeat. As I said um, just a couple of days ago, I think that he would rather die than admit defeat. So in Ukraine, of course, we cannot, with the rest of the world, cannot accept, and, and here we are united in that unity of purpose, which should be uh, our response to aggression anywhere. Uh, and that is to defend uh, the sovereignty, territorial integrity of Ukraine and its right to choose its own path. So uh, Ukraine cannot uh, concede any of the territories. However, uh, Putin and uh, the current Russian leadership will not just pull away. Mm -hmm. So what I am afraid we are going to see is a continuation of the fighting. The best thing that we can hope for is some kind of a ceasefire and then give time for peace negotiations. But I don't think that he'll, he'll back away from, uh, uh, from his ambitions to take over Ukraine. I have one more question on this. Um, and that 
is a quote that I saw in the Atlantic Council, a recent report by them, and they describe Croatia having gone from a war-torn country um, after the War of Independence to a high-income EU member. And it made me think of Ukraine as a, as a candidate nation now. You have countries obviously in the region that, that aren't yet, though have been asking uh, for many years. And whether it's a session to, to NATO or an accession to uh, an organization like EU membership, how important that is for transformation, recovery, hope for, for, for people. It is incredibly, yeah. incredibly important because it provides motivation for people to continue and, and for the governments. And it actually provides you with a blueprint and a catalyst for the necessary reforms that you have to do at home in order to be able to become part of the EU or NATO and fulfilling all the criteria. But we also have to respond back as NATO and the EU with appropriate steps forward uh, for Ukraine and, and for the countries in my neighborhood as well, because uh, the accession of Bosnia and Herzegovina um, and other countries uh, into the European Union has now been halted for years. We're not seeing real progress. We're losing the hearts and the minds of people. Uh, we are seeing doubt and uh, rising support for authoritarian type of regimes, which is all dangerous. Uh, and of course, we want to see stability and prosperity in the region. So we are all ready to help Ukraine on their path to the EU uh, membership. Of course, the road will be extremely difficult. I remember I was a young diplomat. I was 23 years uh, old when the war broke out in Croatia. And in the beginning, I thought it would take ages and ages for us to be able to live with our Serbian neighbors together again, uh, uh, let alone work together towards reconciliation in our own country. Mm -hmm. But we were able to do that. Uh, of course, again, this war was on a much smaller scale, but it required tremendous effort from uh, the government, from people, from the international community. Uh, it also required to be able to forgive, not forget, but forgive and deal with the war crimes uh, that uh, had been committed on mm -hmm. any side and to be able to look into the future rather than just to focus on the past. I mean, this for me is a classic example when we're talking about multi-stakeholder anything. Because if you can't combine like this and give people hope, then I don't know where we are. Ian, come in on well, this, please. Well, just that the last few years have been on the global stage, one where we've seen so many walls go up, mm. so many people around the world that have not been from really difficult environments. And here, the Europeans, 27 countries unanimously voted to embrace a country experiencing a war. They said, we are going to make those 44 million people part of Europe. Yes, they're poorer. Yes, they've got problems with corruption. Yes, they're not as democratic. But you know what? We can't let this stand. And we're going to not only make them Europeans, we're going to make this war our war. That's, a, that's an extraordinary thing for 27 European Union members to do. And does that provide hope in the future for Absolutely. the Europeans? Absolutely it does. That's the kind of leadership we need to see a lot more of in response to global crises. The Ukrainians did nothing wrong other than be, have the territory in the wrong place. How true is that of so many of the places that Elizabeth's been talking about for the last hour and devotes her mm. career to? That's what we need to focus on. I agree. I and you literally led me where I was trying to take us, which again, Brad, you said it as well. It has to be personal for us all. All of these issues, big or small, have to be personal for us all. And then we're all invested in trying to find solutions. We have a final poll for this hour. We asked G0 Media followers, the solutions to global crises should come from the private sector leaders, governments, or multilateral organizations. And here are the results. Private sector, 17%. Governments, 48%. Multilateral organizations, 35%. So, I mean, the answer to this is everyone. Mm -hmm. And we know this and we've all yes. said that. But actually for me, what was surprising there was the amount of people that were saying, I want my elected leaders to take a stand and to fix these things because actually that for me was perhaps higher than I than I thought it was. Elizabeth, you get the say on this because multi-stakeholder is what you are at the United Nations and we have to do more. Well, I'm dying to know the regional and the age yeah, breakdown of that poll, so maybe we can take <laughs> that offline. <laughs> really, really that's afterwards. super encouraging, actually, mm. because the only way governments are going to perform mm. is if their citizens demand that they perform, right? And we all know there are levels of actual intentional disenfranchisement. There are uh, situations where people just feel disaffected. There are obviously authoritarian regimes, not just democratic ones, but 
anything that we can do to empower citizens to demand the most of their leaders uh, in a world that is so troubled but where all our issues are so interconnected I think will only be to the better. You asked about how it looks from a multilateral perspective and a UN perspective. We have seen in the last the last, I would say, decade, an incredible explosion of, um, of platforms and initiatives that bring companies, civil society groups, youth organizations, and young people together with, uh, with the more formal multilateral institutions to try to solve problems. Um, it can be so much stronger even than it is today, but it's a really crucial part of the overall solution set for the kind of uh, challenges that we face. And I think, you know, you see someone like Brad, the fact that you are even here spending as much time as you do as an SDG advocate, caring about about the way the UN works, bringing the kind of talent and ideas of your company and your employees to bear in, in thinking through problems with, uh, with people in this community is, is just really an indication of the kind of, the kind of solution making that we need for the future um, uh, in really serious ways. So these targets, sustainable development goals were set for 2030. So by my reckoning, we have now less than eight years mm -hmm. to reach these solutions. So I do want to project forward what's coming, what, need to, what needs to be done, what do we need to see? And I could bring in, particularly on this concept, something that you've talked about a lot, um, Ian, and, and your viewers will be familiar with, the, the technopolar world, this sort of interplay between governments, between big technology companies that in many cases are more powerful in certain respects than, than governments themselves. They're certainly bigger than some small nations too. Um, responsibilities, challenges, hope. Brad first. Well, what I would say is that the, the SDGs are this extraordinary blueprint for what the world needs. We're basically at the halfway point in, in them and it's a good time to take stock and ask how we can do better because we need to do better. Um, I think what's interesting connecting this to the last piece mm. is that almost every democratic society is fundamentally a three-legged stool. You have government in the public sector, you have business in the private sector, and you have NGOs and civil society. And I think the fundamental key to success is building out all three legs of the stool so that they're strong, they're healthy, and they know how to work together. And the key to working together is having some clarity about what we each do well and what we need others to do well. A lot of the political debates in our societies are fundamentally people on the right saying, I want government to do less so business can do more. And you have people on the left saying, no, I want government to do more so business will do less. We need all of us to do the right things together. And especially when it comes to the SDGs, I think business can innovate faster, faster than anybody else. NGOs, civil society can incubate faster and better than anybody else. And government and government alone can scale. But let's have that conversation. How do we understand what we each can do and then do it better together? It's like basic economics, efficiency, those that are most efficient lead in whichever uh, avenue that is required to get the job done quicker. Ian, mm. eight um, years. That's my approach uh, when we talk about the United States and Europe and democratic societies. Of course, when we talk about China, mm. the ability of the private sector to be the same kind of part of this role. First of all, the Chinese government wants the private sector to have no part of those global institutions, which is a big challenge. Um, but secondly, of course, it is a state-driven economy. And so we do have to recognize that we're increasingly living in a planet that has hybrid systems. Um, and when you have hybrid systems, you're going to have more hybrid solutions. I also understand that the reason why so many people, 48%, say, no, I want governments to do more is because they're the legacy group. And, you know, at the end of the day, the Americans have been growing up in a very different world than the 21st century realities that they're in right now. And the average American is a lot more angry at Biden and Trump for not sol solving their problems than they are Coke and Pepsi. Uh, and maybe that's going to change over 10 or 20 <laughs> years. But we have, to under we have to meet people where they are today. Can we can't very, just drag them. Can I ask a very quick question? Is the world more divided or less divided? And we've talked about many of the fracture lines in eight years' time than it is today. It's, it's more divided globally. Right. but it is more united on certain issues uh, and, and in regard to certain crises. Madam President, final word. What would you like to see? Final word, well, unfortunately, I think we're further away from fulfilling the SDGs than we were a couple of years ago. Uh, however, I believe that we have to start by reinforcing the principles of the UN Charter to begin with. Um, so the, uh, the protection of state sovereignty, territorial integrity, uh, working towards peace, etc. 
There is um, a monument outside of this building uh, that was done by Croatian sculptor Anton Augustinčić. Mm. It's called Monument to Peace. And it's a person on the horse. Everybody thinks it's a man, but no, it's actually a woman. Mm. And the monument is turned away from the UN building because the point is to lead the United Nations in the quest for peace. Uh, so we have to continue to do that. Uh, we have to strengthen multilateral institutions. Obviously, it's the responsibility of all. But looking at what we see today, and we're going to be facing a lot of difficulties come this winter, especially in Europe, uh, with the energy crisis, with inflation and everything else. But we have to maintain solidarity. We have to uh, enforce those sanctions. We have to stand for our values and principles. And we must never let bullies run the world. Yeah. Well said. And no one gets left behind. Thank you, everybody. Brad Smith, Ian Bremer, Elizabeth Cousins, and Kalinda Grabar-Kitarovic. Thank you all for your time today. And thanks to the United Nations Studio for graciously allowing us to live stream from here this morning. I'm Julia Chatterley for everyone at G0. Thanks for watching. And you can see much more content from this award-winning series by heading to g0media.com slash global stage. I wish you all a wonderful afternoon. Thank you for watching.